This is Tall Tale TV, your podcast for sci-fi and fantasy short stories. Of Bandits and Bad Magic by Leslie Heron. Chapter 13, Athrotaxis. Evan had long considered that traveling with the two brothers could easily be compared to joining a circus, but now he could say he knew better. A circus troupe was far more organized. Despite a night of strong drink, decent food, and tall tales, the performers awoke early the next morning to tear down the camp with brutal efficiency and little regard to any lingering hangovers. With tents rolled, fires extinguished, and the herd of loose puffball creatures corralled, they secured the large beasts of burden to the wagons and set off down what the troopmaster called the Old Road. All of the carts had been packed to near bursting with gear, and most of the other members were left to walk alongside the small caravan in lazy fashion. There was no sense of urgency to reach their next destination. Evan was wedged between a pile of garish costumes and a group of hairy pygmies in the back of the troopmaster's personal wagon. He was less than happy when he found out he had been relegated to their ranks due to their similar stature. He pushed his fingers against his sore temples and massaged his aching head. Last night's revelry and drinking had caused him nothing but regret and agony, his hangover having failed to subside over the long hours stuck between smelly tents and smellier pygmies. The stench was overwhelming, but not strong enough to take his mind off the grating sound of Eric's voice as he prattled on throughout the day. So, all these ancient tech and computer components are called technomantic relics? Bozil let out a deep, baritone laugh as he maneuvered the horse around a large stone jutting out of the ground. The forest had reclaimed the old road centuries ago its path only recognizable by the occasional marker, such as this one. You really aren't from here, are you? His mustache twitched with a smile. Yes, many of these rare items we have were traded for goods through our predecessors, back before the portals closed. He sucked in a long, deep breath before closing his eyes, drinking in the peace of the forest. At one time... There was a thriving trade between worlds. Other races and goods moved between them, creating a central hub in the capital city of Ebonvane. He used a meaty hand to gesture back behind them, where he knew Varen was riding on the back of an overly skittish Argelis. That's where the prince is from, and your doppelganger. Bozil's face then fell into a somber expression. Dwarves are long-lived, so I remember the markets. Wonders of a hundred worlds brought to trade for apples and trinkets, the golden age of Ebra. He grew quiet for a time, watching the tall grass sway in the breeze. But the neighboring countries grew jealous. He let out a heavy sigh. Then... The old king was slain in battle, and your lookalike disappeared soon after the war, and one day the portals closed, trapping the visitors on this side. It was not long before Prince Varin was declared unfit to rule by the council, and his half-brother, Lucian, was named Regent Lord. Everything has gone to rot since... Eric rest his chin on his hand, listening to the older man's tale with peaking curiosity. So, why is this the first time I've seen any technology? If trade was that prevalent, even backwater towns like Oxhand should have some items present. Bozil spat over the side of the cart. Bah, the priests of the Axiom. Their religion has been driving east from the far countries, assimilating the populace by force and destroying temples and shrines. They collect any technomantic relics they can get their greedy fingers on and destroy them. Rumor has it they melt them down to make their holy sigils, 
symbolizing the immortal word's superiority over other gods, fey, and technology alike. The regent lord hoards them as well, sending them off to one of the four neighboring kingdoms as he sees fit. They are used to pacify and bribe the warlords not to attack. There are still peddlers that traffic in technomancy, but they can only be found in the biggest cities. Eric raised an eyebrow. So, do your people worship technology then? Is that why they wear it? Bozil barked out a hearty laugh. <laughs> we just use them for shock and awe to impress the less educated. But you're not the first to think that. It gives us an air of mystery. Heathens that consort with powers long forgotten. It helps sell tickets. Nothing more. Eric ran his fingers through the scruff on his jaw. I wonder if I could find enough components to repair the portal locker. I'd need a high-capacity power source, but I could just as easily cobble something rudimentary together. The majority of what I need is relatively commonplace, though, or at the very least, fashionable with the right tools. He perked up at the idea as he patted the bag on his side. <laughs> it's a good thing we're headed to Still Harbor, then. Evan scowled and climbed his way towards the front of the cart. Yeah, that and, oh, I don't know, finding your brother. Eric looked over his shoulder. Chill, man. I didn't forget. Really? Because you've been asking questions all morning, and not one of them was if they'd seen Vel. Eric rolled his eyes. I think if they had seen someone who looked exactly like Varen... They would have mentioned it. Besides, this just might be more important. Evan narrowed his eyes dangerously. You better not mean that. Eric turned further in his seat to face Evan. Look, even if we find him, if... Eric held up his hands defensively. When we find him, we'll still need a way out of this place. Evan narrowed his eyes further. It says a lot that you think leaving this place is more important than finding out what happened to your own brother. Eric scoffed as he returned the tiny merc's hateful scowl with one of his own. If anyone would be fine on their own in a world that runs on swords and sorcery, it would be him. I'll stick to what I'm good at, which is building stuff. He shrugged jokingly, nodding his head towards the group of travelers behind them. Besides, I kind of like his replacement. It's nice not being yelled at all the time. Mosil pulled back on the reins and the horses let out a small protest before coming to a halt. He shifted in his seat to get a good look at both of the bickering men. I can't pretend to understand your situation, but here we are all one big family. He swung his meaty hand around, gesturing to the rest of the performers. And the only way to survive, he pushed a ham finger into Eric's chest, is together. The small one has a point. He sat back. We will be on the road for three more days, so take your time and consider your priorities carefully. Evan looked around as the other carts pulled to a stop alongside the road behind them and began offloading their equipment and tents. With a frown on his face, he looked up at the sun blazing high in the sky. Why are we stopping to set up camp here? We still have plenty of hours before nightfall. Bozil smiled, his mustache curling around his rosy cheeks. Ah, uh, well, you see this? He pointed off to his right at something that was buried beneath eons of overgrowth. A temple to the goddess Tiara, and we always stop to pay our respects. We'll take shelter in the shade of her greatness and pray for the rest of our journey to be safe and prosperous. A deep chuckle rumbled up out of his throat. Plus is good excuse to drink in excess. Evan felt his stomach roil at the memory of their last drinking session. He clamped his hand over his mouth when the wagon rocked as the troopmaster hopped off and grabbed a tent roll from the back. He turned to the doctor, 
swallowing back his bile. Ugh, can you believe this? Look, it'll be fine. Eric stood, stretching his arms over his head. Besides, I need time to make up a shopping list. Evan's jaw tensed as he whirled around. He leveled a finger and tried to articulate just how messed up he thought all this was. Except the only thing he got out was a slew of profanities before he jumped from the wagon, knocking down several pygmies in the process. He could feel the others staring at him as he marched off towards the far end of the line of carts, but he couldn't bring himself to care at the moment. His head throbbed in time with the pounding of his heart as he stormed his way up to the final wagon. He was livid and needed something to distract him. Atlas was leaning against the cart, chatting up the stone Goliath as she hauled gear out of the back, handing it off to passing troop members. His smile twitched playfully as he spotted the tiny dwarf. Oi, here to help with the gear. Let's see. He leaned into the back of the cart and began digging around. Aha, uh -huh. here you go. He pulled out a single tent stake and held it out. Careful now. We don't want you straining yourself. Screw you, man. Evan snatched up the metal spike and in one swift motion, slammed it into the arcanist's shoe, deliberately piercing the boot between the mage's toes. He stepped around the screeching man and up to the stone woman, who was holding a large tent roll in her arms. It was three times his size, but he didn't care. Distraction welcomed. He held out his arms expectantly. The female Goliath quirked an obsidian brow, but did not protest. She gently lowered it down until the tiny creature could balance it on its shoulders. The weight was immense, and Evan could feel his knees shake under the strain. He could hear the mage smirking and set his jaw. Spite was a great motivator, and with considerable effort, he began casually walking away. He was pleased to hear the snickering come to an abrupt stop. Once out of eyesight, however, he collapsed to one knee, sweat pouring down his face as he lowered one end of the tent to rest on the ground. Damn it, Phil! Something in his gut didn't feel right, and he was sure it wasn't a hernia. The brothers may not have gotten along, but they could rarely be separated for any amount of time. Vel was just too overprotective of his sibling. There was no way he'd be gone this long, unless something bad happened to him. Where the hell are you? With a grunt, he hoisted himself under the tent and began moving again, dragging the roll behind him. The numbers that ran through his head looked bleak. Three days to Still Harbor. And assuming they could even get a bead on Vel's location... They would, most likely, have to backtrack another three days. He stumbled, chest heaving as he continued to shoulder the weight. He paused to catch his breath, his eyes landing on a moss-covered vertical stone. The old road had been marked with these. By his calculation, if he just followed them, he could be in Still Harbor in a day. Less if he really pushed himself. But the troop was moving too slow so he'd have to leave Eric behind. He shrugged at the thought. Not like he was alone, right? Evan shifted his grip, now struggling with the massive tent as it dug a trench into the dirt with each step he made. The rest of the crew parted around him like water, some stopping to watch his progress. He could feel his fingers slipping before they went numb and the tent slid from his grasp, pitching him forward into the dirt. He coughed around a mouthful of grit as he pushed himself to his feet. Many of the troop were too busy in their own tasks to notice his fall or offer him aid. But he could see one person caught up in the storm of moving bodies looking for all the world like a lost little puppy. Varen stood next to a wagon, his eyes following others around, waiting for someone to tell him what to do. Evan snarled as he kicked the bundle at his feet. You just gonna watch, or you wanna give me a hand? Varen's brows knit together as his gaze landed on the tiny dwarf. He pointed to himself in confusion. Yes, you! 
You might be a prince, but you still have to help. Varen fished out his slate from his bag and began to scribble on it. He turned it around in response to the order. What should I do? Evan felt his final thread of patience snap. Sweet babies, how useless are you? Varen blinked a few times, his mouth opening and closing like a beached fish. He wiped away his previous message and began to scribble something else. Evan marched up to him, the sound of his own heartbeat filling his ears. Why the hell are you even here? He threw his hands up in the doctor's direction. That's not your brother, and you certainly aren't his, despite what he seems to think. The chalk in Varen's hand snapped as the slate slipped from his fingers, falling to the ground. Evan recoiled at the devastated look the prince shot him before fleeing the camp. He watched him disappear through the tall grass, and didn't need to see them to feel the glares from the troop members. He dropped his hands to his sides, the fire in his veins extinguished by the sinking feeling of shame. He couldn't remember the last time he lost his temper. Evan moved over to pick up the discarded slate. The half-scrawled message read, I'm sorry, I don't know. Shame gave way to regret as he turned in the direction the prince ran. Vel wouldn't want him to leave things like this. Luckily, the prince's trail was easy enough to follow. The tracks left in the soft earth and crumpled grass wandered around before eventually leading him to a crumbling structure. The soil gave way to a long, eroded, cobblestone path that took him through the cracked stone arch of a once proud temple. The walls, fashioned from slabs of thick granite, were carved with reliefs of foreign symbols and delicate art. The cobblestones faded into mosaic tiles that wound through the room like waves of the ocean. Broken pews and altars were buried beneath years of weathered growth. Two of the four walls had succumbed to the years, and trees and brush were threatening to return what was left to the earth. Despite weathering countless storms, one structure remained pristine, as though it had been cared for by pilgrims and travelers throughout the centuries. On a cracked marble dais was the carved statue of a large winged serpent curled elegantly around the body of a massive doe. The tips of their faces touched in a frozen display of affection that could still be seen despite the years of weathered erosion. At the base of the statue sat the prince. He had his knees tucked up to his chin, hands folded around his legs, and he was sobbing silently. Evan felt his heart ache. He brushed the cobwebs out of his hair and followed the mosaic tiles. Thick roots had taken up in the cracks of the two walls, giving birth to the massive, thick canopied trees that now acted as the roof, letting in small shafts of sunlight between the leaves. The silence was broken only by the crunch of his boots on the dirt path and the occasional call from a distant bird. Reaching the stone dais, Evan climbed up until he was standing next to the prince. He reached up and placed a hand on the other man's shoulder. Listen, I'm sorry. I didn't... He had to look away from that tear-streaked face. I didn't mean what I said back there. He let his hand fall away before turning back to face him. Not that that makes it any better. Varen gave a half-hearted shrug and tucked farther into himself. No, it's not okay. I was cruel, and you didn't deserve that. Evan scuffed his shoe as he chewed his words. I just... I miss my friend. I'm worried something bad might have happened to him. I thought you were here to replace him and I was afraid I'd never see him again, so I took it out on you. He slumped to the ground next to the prince with a sigh. <sighs> I'm no better than those brutes back in your town. Varen shook his head and pushed his finger into the dirt, scrawling out the words, You're not like them. Evan felt a small smile return to him after such an arduous day. 
He pulled the slate tablet and chalk out of his bag and handed it over to the prince. You dropped this. I thought you might want it back. Varen stared at the slate for a moment before reaching out and taking it. He wiped it clean and plucked up one of the broken pieces of chalk. The ability to speak was something Evan realized he took for granted, as it takes twice as long to write out what needs to be said. But he waited patiently, listening to the gentle tapping of the chalk on the slate as it echoed off the leafy canopy. Varen stared down at his words, going over them before turning it towards the tiny mark. I don't know how to help, because no one has ever showed me. I'm useless. Evan felt that familiar pang of guilt return to him as he slowly absorbed the prince's words. You're not useless. I know a lot of this must be weird for you, seeing a guy who looks like your brother but really isn't. But I've seen what Vel can do, and I know you got that in you, too. Varen's shoulders sank as he added to his previous message, I'm not him. Evan sighed, running a hand through his hair. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I'm just as bad as that idiot. He scratched behind his ear nervously before barreling on. But you're right. You're not him, and that's a good thing. A frown creased Varen's brow as he made to wipe away his last message. Hold on, let me finish. Evan put out his hand, halting the prince's attempt to interrupt. I've known those two for over a year now, and they can do some pretty amazing stuff. Eric is a literal genius, and Vel is almost, almost as tough as I am. Maybe a little more so, but don't tell him I said that. Varen's frown deepened. Evan smiled. But... They are complete and total screw-ups. Eric is worthless at anything other than being a nerd. He shrugged. And Vel? Uh, he has a laundry list of issues so long, I can't even begin to explain how emotionally stunted the guy is. He dropped his hands and sat back into the dirt. The point is, we all have our flaws. Look at me. I'm only two feet tall. I'm greedy, bullheaded... And I get a little too defensive at times. But I focus on what I'm good at, which is solving problems. We let Eric crunch the numbers, and Vel handles the physical tasks. He looked up at the prince, the smile returning to his face. Everyone has something they can contribute. We just have to find out what it is you got. Varen soaked in the tiny dwarf's words, and slowly... A rare feeling washed over him. Hope. It had been a long time since someone had taken an interest in him. The last person to care for him was his father. Not that he could recall much of the man, as he was still a child when he passed. He ran his hand across the slate and replaced the previous message with, Thank you. Evan gave him a wide smile, but he was torn. He knew that this was the right thing to do, and he could see how fragile the prince really was. His heart warred with the notion of helping this man, to keep him from falling back into depression and self-loathing, or finding his friend. He sighed. Vel was just gonna have to wait a little longer. The two sat in stagnant silence, before Evan, choking under the uncomfortable air, cast around for anything to talk about. His eyes landed on the creatures carved atop the stone pillar. From this angle, he could see the almost grotesque features of the two animals. The snake wore a wreath of feathers around its head like a crown, with two horns jutting from the back of its head. Its long, sinewy body was adorned in jewelry and covered in crystals. The doe, large and muscular, had six legs and a forked tail. It had an abnormal row of spines along its back that were jagged and curled antlers that didn't look like they belonged on a female deer. Looking at the two of them, intertwined for all eternity, filled Evan with a sort of unease. So, uh, 
What's with the creepy statue? He pointed up at the figures. Varen followed the tiny merc's gesture, and a bright smile came over him as he wiped away his previous message. He scrawled out a new one before lifting the slate. The old gods, Diara and Revaria. Evan could see the way the prince perked up at the subject. Old gods? Varen's smile turned into a toothy grin as he opened his mouth, but it was a fleeting emotion as he looked down at the slate tablet in his hands. A sad frown returned to his face as he wrote, It's a long story. You should ask someone else. He gestured at the chalk in his hand with a shrug. Evan leaned back, closing his eyes a little against the rays of sunlight that broke through the thick green canopy. He knew the best place to help grow the prince's confidence was by making him feel he was important enough to listen to. He looked back over at the man and lifted his shoulders with a crooked grin. I ain't going nowhere. Of Bandits and Bad Magic is book three of the ongoing series by Leslie Heron. Tune in every few weeks to hear the latest chapter as it's being written. If you'd like to listen to books one and two, you can find links in the description. So, I always get something confused. Stalagmites are the ones that point down, right? What am I saying? With you around, I'm sure they both point up. Eh, cheesy, but acceptable. Okay, how about we rock each other's worlds? Oh, that was just pathetic. Why don't I show you my rock hammer, and we chisel away a few hours together? Eh, not bad. Any others? Uh, give me a second. Rock puns are hard. Ha! I see what you did there. Got it. Let's go lay you down so I can explore your topography. I'll give you points for originality, but that one wasn't technically rock-related. Oh, come on. Nope, try again.